Well, welcome class back to the next study here in Luke. We'll be in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 23. We are almost done with our study. I do want to say this from the jump. Uh, the next two weeks, we're going to take off. So no, no class uh, next Sunday or the Sunday after that. Those are the two Sundays uh, right before and right after Thanksgiving. Uh, we're going to come back. I think it's December 6th and December 15th, something like that. Those will be the last two Sundays uh, of our class. So we're almost there. And we have one of my favorite men on the planet, Jaron Wilkerson. Uh, we are blessed, church, to be able to call this man one of our elders, one of the leaders of our church. Uh, very blessed. Uh, thankful, uh, Jaron, for your service, for your leadership, um, of, the, of the sacrifices that you make as an elder. Uh, if you've never walked in those shoes, which of course I haven't, but I've walked closely with men who have, um, and, I, and there's sacrifice and there's challenges there. And I just thank you uh, collectively from the church perspective to say thank you uh, for everything that you and the elders do for us. And we're grateful that you're teaching today. Uh, we were supposed to have Ira with us, um, another one of my favorites, Ira Griffith, but he had some uh, personal stuff happen the last week or so, so you're going to be the only uh, teacher for us. But we want to say thank you, Ira, for your commitment to teach with us, and uh, we miss you, brother. Uh, but Jaron, you got this. I'm excited about it. So uh, Jaron, for those who don't know you, give us a quick introduction, and then we'll get into our study today. Well, thank you so much, Adam, and good morning. It is great to be with everybody. Uh, it's, it's an honor and uh, a privilege and, quite frankly, humbling to be able to uh, share some thoughts from the book of Luke. Uh, my wife and I, Connie, and, and uh, we've got th uh, three adult children and five grandchildren. Uh, we have been a part of North Atlanta for about 11 years. Uh, we've been uh, Christians for, gosh, I won't, a long time. <laughs> I'll just say that, a long time. So we've uh, learned a lot and still are learning. And my hope and prayer is that we will continue to learn, even as a group this morning, Amen. as we look at a familiar passage and see how we can dissect it to make it meaningful in terms of how we live. All right. Well, I can't wait to hear what you got for us, Jaron. So, hey, this is your lesson. And so I'm going to turn it over to you. And, and uh, we look forward to hearing what God has to say. Well, thank you. Here's how we're, we're going to do this. And I just want to kind of set the format because I do think it's important. Uh, at least I'm the kind of guy who kind of likes to know what the end might look like and where we're going. So uh, for those who maybe might be worried like me, I'm going to help you for the others who are a little more free flowing. Well, just bear with us. Here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do three sections. Okay. One, an overview. Well, first of all, a general view of uh, what I'll call just a background, baseline things about the Bible, to a, an overview of Luke 23. And I'm sure if you've looked at Luke, there's a lot to unpack there. So we're not going to go through all of it, but we're going to highlight some things that, that I think might be important. And then some sprinkle some questions in along the way, and then ending it with some additional questions and some teachings that we can take away uh, this morning. So with that as a backdrop, first, a general perspective. I view the Bible as not just a book to read and, and get a history of where things are. That's fine and that's good. But I also think the Bible is a method book. It is a method book by which we can learn to live. I'll let that marinate for just a little bit. It's a method book. How should I live as a follower of Jesus? So when reading the Bible as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, the first thing is, what was Jesus's mission? Why was he here? Well, I'll go in and answer that. Now, a lot of the things I'm going to be asking, I'm going to ask questions along the way, and I won't answer these questions necessarily. I want to put them out there for us to think about them as we look at a few verses and then ask ourselves, uh, how might we answer that? So, but I'm going to, I want to lay this foundation. So I really do want to answer that question. Okay. What was, what was Jesus's mission? If we're going to be a follower of Jesus, what was his mission? Luke 19, which we covered some time back, tells us what it was. Luke 19, 10. 
to seek and save the lost. That's why he was here. So now if I'm a follower of him, maybe that should be my mission. <laughs> I'm not going to say maybe. I'm not going to do like one of my good friends who's probably listening. Now. I'm not going to say maybe, perhaps. No, it is <laughs> our mission also. It is our mission. Now, how might we then be a follower? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20 says that we should be his ambassador. Mm. Or using another term, we're his representative. Yes. So if we are a follower of him and someone meets us, they ought to be able to see him in me or us. I'm his representative. Another point, if I'm a follower, his mission was to seek and save the lost, I should be the aroma yeah. of him. Now, aroma, I know it's about smelling and all that. Well, well, it's no, we should smell like Jesus. Second Corinthians um, chapter 2, verses 15, for those who want a reference point, we should be the aroma of Christ. So what does that then mean? And all this is all just, we haven't even gotten into Luke 23 yet. Hey, this is all just on. trying to set up what we're going to talk about in Luke. Well, if we're going to be the ambassador of Christ, if we're going to be the aroma of Christ, then it's, the Bible tells us we should be transformed. So that means I shouldn't be the old Jaron that you might have known in high school or college or whatever. Now, if I was doing great, fine, but let's just say I wasn't always... So I, I need to transform, transforming the way I think and transforming the way I live. I want to say that again, transformed in the way I think and in the way I live. Yep. I do on a professional level, do some things and use instruments and so forth that help folks with their place and trying to move forward. And there's an instrument you can use, an assessment, and I won't name it, uh, but it deals with thinking style. Well, we don't really deal with people based on how they think, because most of us don't know how another person's thinking. We deal with people based on what we see, behavior. Mm -hmm. So our thinking, though, is an indicate when our when we act a certain way, it does indicate how we're thinking, right? Because that's what we, but our behavior shows that. So anyway, moving on, I use both of these together because in essence, your thinking should be at least congruent with your behavior. Now, if that's out of whack, well, then we got a bigger issue. So how we think, the Bible says we should think, we should be transformed in our thinking. We should be transformed the way we live. And then last piece about background, we should be a connector. Yes. Um, we have a mantra at, at, at North Atlanta Church of Christ about, Loving first. Well, we don't have to kind of, we don't have to figure out what loving is. All we got to do is go to 1 Corinthians 13, and we can just start reading in verse 4 through 7, and it tells us what love is. Love is kind, love is patient, love is kind. We can read it ourselves. So if we're not sure what love is and how to love first, well, just go back and read that, and then ask yourself, am I patient? Am I kind? Do I keep record of all, all those things there? So, but see, that's about living, how I live, because I'm supposed to be transformed. And if I'm acting another way, well, then I'm not, I'm not a good aroma. Mm -hmm. I'm not a good representative. Mm -hmm. And of course, this loving first is not only about external, seeking and saving the lost external, it also means how we treat each other within the family. Yes. It's also how we treat each other within the family yes. and then outside of the family. Okay. Darren, uh, what is the word? You texted me this word when T. Buckner was teaching her class about how God sees us. Jesus uh, sees us. We should see each other. And you texted me a word and it, it just came back to me. I can't remember the word, but that text came back to me when you started talking about being a connector. What was that word? Glad to share it with you. Though it's a it's a Swahili term called sawabona, 
S-A-W-U-B-O-N-A. It means I see you. I see you. Now the 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 response is thank you. I exist. <laughs> I do exist. But the main thing about being a connector is Jesus saw everybody. Yes, come on. Even the person that he didn't see, but he felt the man who touched his garment. Mm. He saw him. Mm. Our challenge is to see people, see them as individuals. And I think that's a struggle for us. And it's even getting more of a challenge for us as we move through society. We're becoming more and more what I call reclusive. Hmm. And we're allowing, and I'm, I'm not against technology, but we're allowing technology sometimes to interfere with our ability to connect. We don't even know how to talk to someone. We can send them an email or a text, but we really don't even know how to talk. Yep. Um, we don't know how to disagree. We don't know how to show. So, so, so Sawabona just means I see you, Adam Pa, as an individual. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to, I'm just, I see you as who you are. Mm. Now that requires a lot. That requires me not thinking about where I'm trying to go to the grocery store. That, that, that means that when you pass by me, I do see you. You're not just a figment or something that just passed by me walking in the hallway. I see you. Mm. Jesus operated that way. He saw everybody. And so I would even just say for us, myself included, if I don't see a person who passes by me, the question might be, am I an aroma that's good? Now, I know some of us might be saying, well, you just can't see everybody. Well, Jesus did. <laughs> so maybe that's an opportunity for us to work on that. That's right. Discipleship is a direction. We're going to continue to commit ourselves to that direction. That's why we're learning. So if I didn't see someone, the reason that I personally don't see someone is I've got something else on my mind. Right. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not other oriented. I'm Jaron oriented now. Oh, that's good. Wow. Wow. So Jaron, that's why you didn't see that person because you were into your own stuff. Mm. Well, I could be in, so, so I don't want to get off on that too far, but that's huge, yep. Yep. huge, it's big, it fits into all this. We have to see each person because each person has value. So each person is, is made in the image of God. We're each all person is made in the image of God. And since Jesus saw, then we need to see and we can measure our own ability to see by how much we do see others or not. So we can be our own judge of our ability to see others based on, do we really see them? And, and of course, here's, here's the last part about that. All of us want to be seen. Yes. Every person wants to be seen. Right. Even the people who do bad things, sometimes they do those things to at least be seen, yeah. which right. is sometimes kind of sad that we want, we might do bad things. Um, I've heard it said that some any attention is better than no attention. So when people are hurting, sometimes they act out. Yep. And I've heard hurt people hurt people. We need to be that good aroma. So anyway, let's yeah. go on and get into uh, uh, an overview of the chapter now. And again, I want to emphasize this. We're not going to go verse by verse and all that. You can, we can all read it. I do want to highlight a few things here, a few areas that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about first Jesus with Pilate. Okay. First, Pilate was a Roman governor. Uh, one of his jobs was to keep the peace. The crowd brought Jesus to him to be crucified. And I thought, wow, uh, that's an interesting thing. They just bring in, bring in this guy who was just trying to do good 
and they this brought him to Pilate and said, crucify this guy. Now, without getting into the history of crucifixion and how bad it is and all that, it's let's we all most of us who are listening to this, we 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 know what crucifixion is and we understand that story about the 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 crowd brought Jesus to be crucified. In verse three, Pilate said, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' response was you have said so. You say. He said, you have said so. Now, rather than try to dissect that statement of whether he answered directly, indirectly, or whatever, he gave a direct response. Right. Now, later on, Pilate, in verse 4, Pilate says uh, to the crowd, I find no fault in this man. Now, one of the things I want to go back now, and, and I'm going to sprinkle some questions that are somewhat rhetorical, but not necessarily so. Let's just kind of unpack what just happened in that one situation at the very beginning of chapter 23. Pilate says, uh, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you have said so. What is highlighted to me in that, uh, maybe this is a question I would ask. When we're asked a question, and don't give a direct answer, does that raise more questions? Mm. Does that challenge trust? I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanna use a scriptural piece and I'm gonna give a little antidote here. Proverbs 19.21 says, when words are many, sin is not far behind. Let's marinate on that a little bit. Proverbs 10, 19, when words are many, sin is not far behind. I'm going to do a little antidote. My parents must have taken a page from, uh, from Jesus' example. Uh, they expected direct answers from us growing up. Have you ever asked somebody something and said, well, did you? Did you did you eat the cookie? Well, and here's a, here's a response that sometimes, well, see now what happened was, and then you start going off on all. all well, the question was, did you eat the cookie? <laughs> right. And this could be a southern thing, growing up in the south, but my parents used to say, well, gosh, um, sounds like you're telling a story. Now I don't know if if you've heard that phraseology before, but I'll just say in our family, uh, to tell somebody they were lying or, or that's a lie, that was considered derogatory or a little, little, little harsh or whatever. So my folks, be them educated and educators, they wouldn't say, well, that's a lie or whatever. They would say, sounds like you're telling a story. Mm. Now think about that, a story, <laughs> is a story it's a, got a lot of pieces a lot of angles to it right <laughs> i had not thought about that as much really adam until i was looking at this because it was a guess you guys tell lots of stories <laughs> well that's not a, that was not a compliment <laughs> okay. right <laughs> so so what i appreciated about this even at the very beginning of luke 23 jesus was direct mm. he there was not a lot of words in his response. Yep. It was, he shot straight. Maybe that's a lesson we can take away, to answer things directly when we're asked and not be accused of messing with things and we're concerned about trust or telling stories. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, so now some, some more questions. Since Pilate had the authority to let an innocent man, Jesus, go, why did he not? Now, we can talk about that a little bit, but I just have a few other questions and we'll move on. Because I'm doing this from a question point of view, more so than I'm trying to give in. I'm with you. A few questions for us. Have we been in a situation where we had influence of power, 
to affect the outcome and we and we did the pilot whether we are a school teacher whether we're a parent whether we are over an organization whatever have we been in a situation where we had the power or the authority to affect the outcome and we did not accept our responsibility we did the pilot and sometimes we might say well i i didn't say anything i was just quiet well the question is is silence complicit right it's a question yep. i think we know the answer is silence complicit and here's the last question for us to think about about that. We're asked to be salt. We're asked to be light. Does Matthew 5, 13 through 16, does it have any relevance here relative to our ability to influence, our ability to make a decision or affect something you know, in a positive way? And we're silent or we don't. Is that an aroma? Is that being light? Is that being salt? Is that an aroma? Is that a representative of Jesus. Okay, moving on to Herod, because I know we need to move on. We, good. Move, no, this is good. Moving on to Jesus with Herod. This is another segment about Jesus with Herod. Verse 6. Now, this was interesting. When Pilate learned that Jesus was from Galilee, what did he do? <laughs> he pushed oh. him off to Herod. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's, I don't got to deal with it. I'm doing the pilot. See, <laughs> right. See, see, he did the, he created this. <laughs> He's doing, he said, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do the pilot. Okay. Sure. I'm going to just kick this. I'm going to push this man off. Now, wow. He had the authority, the ability. He could have just shut that down right then. But no, he didn't. And in, so then he gets with Herod, verse 9. Well, Herod wanted to toy with Jesus a little bit, had many questions. Yep. He wanted to see some miracles. That's, that's why he, he was all excited. He thought, let me see what this guy can do. I want to see some miracles. But Jesus used the tactic that Solomon mentioned in Proverbs 26, verse 4 through 6. And I won't read it. It just basically says, when you're dealing with, and Solomon called it a fool, but when, you, when you're dealing with somebody that's got untoward, you don't continue to get in the boat with them. You don't keep on messing with them. That's right. You just back away. We can read it ourselves in Proverbs 26, verse 4 through 6. Again, Solomon called it dealing with fool. Now, we, whether we want to call Herod a fool or not, the point is he had bad intentions, and Jesus knew that. Yep. The tendency we might do is we want to fend and prove and get in and trying to sort. No, um, I've heard this saying, when you're dealing with a pig, uh, you need to pull up because both of you will get muddy. Yeah, yeah. Only the pig will like it. <laughs> Only the pig will like it. Yep. Don't deal with the pig. Don't, don't go there. So what did Jesus do? Since Pilate was an ego-driven kind of a leader, and he, he, he didn't mock Jesus, but he had his subordinates, or he allowed his subordinates to mock Jesus. Yep. But what I liked about what Jesus did, Jesus said nothing. He said nothing. Um, it's been said that when you give a person power or influence, you'll see their true character. Um, Herod could have been kind. He was not, not so much. Herod found in verse 11, Herod found no reason to punish Jesus. So he sent him back to Pilate. But I think it's important for us to, to note that while Herod was asking him all these questions and saying all these things, Jesus said nothing. I, I was discipled uh, to think about this in, in a way of sometimes people ask you questions, but they don't really want to know the answer. Of course. You know, they don't, they don't really, they're not really listening. You know, they are asking questions, but they're not really listening. And, and Jesus here is like, you know, you don't really want to know the answer anyway. And not only that, there is a peace for me with Pilate and Herod that at the end of the day, God's will was going to be done in this situation. And because yes. there's a part of me, Jared, that just wants Jesus to do the miracle, to say the thing, to convince them so he could get off because he's right. unfair. This is an unjust situation going on here. 
and I want him to just go. But then I take a step back, and no, and a part of me is like, no, this is Jesus once again in obedience, saying, this is the will of my Father. And yeah, I could convince them, I could say more, I could perform a miracle, but God's will be done, right? That just happened in verse twenty-two or in yes. verse twenty-one, and He's following up. Got this is God's will, and I want to let it happen. And I, and I, and and let's just piggyback on that just a little bit, Adam. And I'm with you. Sometimes I just want. God, just zap them. Just, just handle this. Do right. it. Just, Do it. Just, and I know some of us are probably thinking now, well, this was already predestined and Jesus knew. Right, right. I, let's not, I'm going to challenge us to not go there. Mm, mm. I want to challenge us or, or ask us to stay at this place at this time. Mm. And then to ask ourselves, if we already know the victory is won, we, we, we say that as Christians, but then are we challenged to then do what Jesus did? And that's not to get in the mix. That's good. Are we challenged to say, okay, I know the outcome is going to be good, but am I willing to sacrifice my own desire for Jesus to fix this, mm. take care of it, and then let me be a representative that maybe hits this other person upside the head, okay? Because I or even say to them, you don't really want to know the answer. You're just toying with me. Mm. I'm sure all of us, I know I have had people to toy. And my tendency is to get rid of, get them off my back. Sure. Well, that's playing with the pig Mm. who lacks the mud. Mm. And if I get in that, now we've got two people behaving in a way that's not an aroma of Christ. That's good. That's so good. Jesus showed it. So here's a question for us. When we see a person mistreated physically or verbally, do we speak out or do we remain silent? When we are part of a group that shows favoritism toward injustice, that's what was going on with Herod. He was, he was a part they they had some favoritism and some injustice going on do we sacrifice our comfort zone and remain silent or do we leave the environment or do we speak out because we have three options at that point we're part of a group that is showing injustice school community whatever it doesn't matter business do we speak out do we remain silent or do we leave? Because those are basically the three options we have. Those are personal decisions. But as a Christian, we have to go back up to that mission again about Jesus. Am I a Roma? Am I a representative? Or am I a secret agent Christian? I am a secret agent. I don't let the group know hmm. where I stand. Hmm. I don't say anything. Why? Because, well, the consequences might not be so pretty. Hmm. And I don't want those. And I want to be liked by everybody. Hmm. Hmm. Here's the last question. Do we buddy up with individuals or groups that promote or accept injustice? Hmm. Do we buddy up? Are we apart? We have to ask ourselves, with that, is that what Jesus did? Now, moving on because of our time, um, let's go to Jesus with Barabbas. This is still the overview of Luke 23. Jesus with Barabbas. In verse 20, verse 22, uh, Pilate wanted to release Jesus two or three times. He, and I imagine you're the leader. Two or three times he goes to the crowd and wants to release him. Uh, but the, the crowd says, no, 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 I, I, we want Barabbas. Now, Barabbas had been a bad guy causing issues and even accused of murder. The crowd, now Jesus was innocent, but the crowd wanted the murderer, the accused murderer, to be released. And, oh, and by the way, this was Passover, and I understand it was customary to release a prisoner, at least one prisoner on doing Passover. Amazing to me, and we can really unpack this in a whole host of ways. Why on earth would a crowd want an innocent man 
released, an, an innocent man killed, and get a guy who had been accused of murder. That's an interesting piece within itself. Why would a crowd want to go there? And we could spend a lot of psychological time and all that um, in trying to dissect that. But what's interesting is Pilate nor um, Herod had any malice toward Jesus. Right. They could have, either one of them could have prevented the outcome, the tragedy that happened, but they allowed an innocent man to be killed. Now, I don't, I can only speak for myself about something like that. To allow and to knowingly allow an innocent person to be killed. And I had the ability to speak in and step up. And I didn't. Uh, I don't, I can't speak for anybody else, but to me, that would just be, I think that'd be one of the worst things that I could have done other than do the, do the deed myself. Mm. To allow somebody who's innocent that I'm aware of and I'm in the mix and say nothing. Mm. Or to allow somebody to be hurt in a bad way. And we have a chance, those of us who are in business, corporate, we, we, I won't get into, let's just say I've been sitting in some of those seats where injustice was done. Certain people wouldn't be able to receive bonuses. Certain people wouldn't be able to, to, you, 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 you play the part and you know that they're going to lose their jobs if you do certain things and you let that situation happen. And then you still walk among the crowd as though everything is okay. And you know that there's a cliff that's coming eventually because you sit in a room and didn't speak up when power wanted to do X or Y. Mm. These are, this is where the rubber meets the road for us as Christians. Do we speak up or do we stay? A couple of questions about Barabbas. Have we been silent when false information is included or omitted? Have we been silent when false information is included in, a, in an equation or in a mix or intentionally omitted? Have we been silent when it's an opportunity to speak power to truth, uh, truth to power? And I know that's hard. Yes. It's hard. It is. So I'm not, that's not lost on me that it's not hard. But I think if we ask that question and answer it truthfully, then we have a possible disconnect because if we're supposed to be a representative of Christ, we established that at the very beginning. If we're supposed to be the aroma of Christ, it doesn't mean we have to be ugly. We shouldn't be. Jesus wasn't. But are we secret agent Christians then? And then we have to ask ourselves, are we even being Christ-like at all? Because what value is it for us to be a Christian, sit in a seat and see things going on that's non-Christian oriented, and then as far as everybody knows, I'm going along because I'm quiet or I participate. That's the question I think we have to ask ourselves. Well, and I've said this before, probably even in this study, but you've talked about transformation at the beginning. Yes. Now you're talking about what I see as obedience. Uh, and we, you know, we've always said, if you get revelation, hey, here's the revelation of what it looks like to look to, to be like Christ. If you want to have the transformation, you want to live into the transformation of Christ, then you need to have that step of obedience. And you're calling yes. us to a step of obedience. You're reminding us that there's like love first. You talk about the tagline, love first, love first right here. There, there are implications to that. There are, there are Christian ethics that are, that, that, that because of love first that we live into. Um, and they're not easy, like you said, but there are absolute implications to love first. There's implications to being the aroma of Christ. Um, and I hear that, that challenge. And I, and I want to say thank you. And that's why I love you as an elder, reminding us of that and calling us up. But I also wanted to say this, I want to rewind a little bit, you know, okay. I don't want to get into the psychology too much of the Barabbas thing, but okay. I will say the mob mentality is so powerful. You oh, know, um, I remember watching this scene in, um, and, you know, watching like in the, the Bible store, when you go back and you watch this scene happen, um, 
and they show the Pharisees and the San, Sanhedrin, right? They're, they're, they're pumping up the crowd. Like, you know, people start seeing other people doing it, and then they jump onto it. And here's what it reminded me of in this season that we're in right now, Jaron. Scripture warns us of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Caesar. Yes. And basically, the, basically warning you of this mob mentality that can happen in religion yes. and this mob mentality that can happen in politics. Yes. And we need to be, as Christians, you're calling us up here. You're calling us up to a different ethic. We need to be reminded of that mob mentality around both those things because we've both yes. seen that happen. Yes. And it's so destructive to the church of Jesus Christ. It's so destructive to the witness of yes. Jesus Christ. Um, and it's, it, it causes, there's so many, there's so many, there's, it's spiritual warfare, of course, but we need yes. to be aware of the spiritual warfare of the mob mentality that can happen in religion and that yes. can happen in politics. Amen. Uh, so I did want to just say that because that's what I thought about when I read the story. Of right. and see, there you go. And, and thank you for sharing that. I will just add this to, and, and you didn't say this, but I want to just do a plug for fellowship. This is why we should be in fellowship with each other because we need to help each other sometimes see what we don't see. Amen. We need to help each other and see if we stay secluded. Um, there are some secret agent Christians who just only want to uh, come here, sermon, whatever, and go home. We learn how to live this kind of life. We learn how to be transformed. We learn our thinking by being around others who are also striving to do the same. And it takes a while because as you said, speaking truth to power or doing, that's hard. I mean, when the crowd is going this way, yeah, we don't like to be off by ourselves. I mean, it's just God wired us to, we, we want to be in the mix. But, but, but if we're going to follow Christ, we have to look at how he did. Come on. And there were some things he just wouldn't get in the mix on. He wouldn't even participate. Now, does that make, it doesn't fit with the Norman Vincent Peale, how to win friends and influence people sometimes, because some people will say, well, who, who do you think you are or whatever? So that's where compassion, kindness, and patience and all that stuff comes in. Well, discipleship, I, when I hear you say fellowship, what I think about is discipleship is done in relationship. Absolutely. absolutely. Iron, iron sharpening iron, it happens in relationship. And if you don't have that part of your discipleship journey, hey, let me put a plug in here for spiritual mentors. If you want a spiritual mentor, hit me up. Jaron, just as my boss, I wanted to just say this publicly, I have hooked up more spiritual mentors in this season than ever before. Uh, because we need to be discipling each other in relationships. So if you want one, come get one. That's see, that's how we learn. And I would even say, uh, Adam, to challenge that a little bit, when I say challenge in a positive way, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And when you invite someone to come, they won't come. So I would almost say sometimes we need mm. to say, you know what? You need a mentor. Okay. You need a mentor. So hit me up so I can get you a mentor. You, is that, is that better? That, I like that much better. All I right. mean, you know, we, we, we do this in the business world, you know, you bring a new employee in or whatever, or you, even a, when a person moves from one position to another, you get a mentor and it's not asked whether you want one or not, you get one. And, and what does that mean? It's basically helped. It's, it's, it's helped with the transition. It's, it's, it's helping the person onboarding as we call it. Well, to me, as a Christian, when, you, when, when, when we become first baptized, we become a member of Christ's body, we need some onboarding <laughs> because we don't, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know how we should operate. And while we understand that in business, now see, we clearly get that in business. Oh, we get it in the Indian arena. New teacher comes on board. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, you're gonna onboard that person. You know where the copy. You all of that. And you're always gonna need that. Not and just you're always you gonna need it. That's Every right. each level of growth. Yes. We yes. need that. Awesome. So uh, thank you for putting that plug in about about mentors. But now Adam just said, "I'm changing uh, my language around that." You not the language don't, around that part. I'm changing my language. I'm changing my language. Not if you need a mentor, you need a mentor. So you need up. one. So come, come, hit me up. I've got them for you. Okay. All right. Good. I'm good. All right. Thank you. So this. Okay. Move. And then now, Jesus at the cross. Okay. Verse thirty-four. 
love this part where he said, good grief. Now, all this has happened to him. And I know we missed out some things. I'm sure some of the people said, well, we missed, we left some verses out. Remember I told you at the beginning, we're not going to go through each one. Um, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, what's so significant ab about that? I've used the phrase a whole lot of times. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And I've had to learn that. I'm learning that still, even at this point in my life, I'm learning that there's a lot that I don't even know that I don't know. So I operate out of the knowledge, and this is something I learned early, early on in my life. We all do what we do based on the information that we have. Yep. Some of us can look at somebody and say, why'd they do that? I wouldn't have done that. Well, you have some different information. What I've learned from people is when they do what they do, it's basically being done out of the information that they have at that time in their life. Right. Hence the need to grow and mentorship and all that. So Jesus knew that the folks who killed him or were trying to, they didn't know what they didn't know in so many ways. They were rude, unkind, insensitive, all that, but they didn't understand that they're dealing with God. They're dealing with God. Now, one of the two guys on the cross on either side of Jesus kind of began to sense that a little bit. <laughs> he he kind of thought, well, this is, uh, you know, he said to the other, his other buddy, you know, we deserve to be here, but he does not. Well, I, I won't get off on that because we can talk to we can talk about all that, but that's not my point that I wanted us to take away is Jesus did not hint blame at all. He didn't blame. There was no retaliation. There was no hatred expressed. Wow, that's powerful. Yep. When you're being mistreated or when you are being harmed or hurt, even in this point, death. No blame. No retaliation. No hatred expressed. Quite frankly, he was thinking about the people who were still here. He sacrificed himself. Now, I know sometimes we can, as Bible scholars, we can go and say, well, but he knew he was going to rise again. He, he knew all that. Remember, he was a man just like we are. He was human. He was flesh. So let's not go there to say he did it because he knew he was going to, he knew he was going to rise again. That'll be next week. I guess when we talk about that, and that, that group handled that. In three, in three weeks. Just, in three weeks. Okay. Well, okay. Let's just deal with where we are right now at this point and not try to project and say, well, he knew he, you know, no. He remember in Gethsemane, he said, Father, if, if, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He did not want, who would want to, I mean, even if you know you're going to come back, who wants to be ridiculed, nailed on a cross? I mean, that would take a whole lot of, Good grief, even if you know you were coming back, and let me just sacrifice for these people who don't even care for me. So basically, Jesus sacrificed himself. It's sometimes maybe easy to sacrifice ourselves if we know a sacrifice a situation if we know the person cares about me, our children, our whatever. Jesus covered on both sides. Yep. The person who didn't care about him, and also the person who cared. Lesson for us. How easy is it for us to sacrifice ourselves for the good of the whole? And this is not about death. This is just about, again, being a representative of, of, of Christ yeah. in Aroma when we don't speak truth to power, when we are silent. When we allow injustice and things to happen, or when we don't call a brother or sister up in an upward call. Mm, I like that, upward call. When we don't call a person to an upward call mm. in terms of their behavior, mm. in terms of their thinking. Because mm. that's how we grow. If we go back 
to our children. Hopefully all of us, I'm going to make the positive assumption. We love our children. But we don't just allow any kind of behavior, any kind of thinking to happen. Why? Because we want them to grow up and be mature and positive. So we, we, we do things upward call. You know, that, that reminds me with the example of the children. As a counselor, I used to say this. I've met very few parents who don't love their kids. Very, very few. I mean, I don't even know if I actually, I don't know if I've actually ever met the parent. Most parents love their kids, but there's a difference yes. between a loving parent and a responsible parent. Yes. And, and responsible parents, there's discipleship there, right? There's yes. calling up there. And that's what I hear you as yes. brothers and sisters in Christ. We love each other. But we want to be responsible. We want that love to also be responsible of what we're calling each other up. So I love, I love that call. But I will say this on this part, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. My takeaway when I read it was this affection for Jesus of, of knowing yes. the amount of grace that he gives us. Because I know for me, like you already said, there are things I do that I don't know that I do. There's things I don't know that I don't know. And thank God that that's the umbrella in which we get to grow in. That's yes. the umbrella that we get to be called up in, not an umbrella of shame, but an umbrella of going, hey, you are already forgiven for the things you don't know. So now you can grow in that. I've already talked about this grace-driven effort. Your yes. effort is under the umbrella of grace. Yes. See, this is, it's so, thank you so much, brother. This, see, there's so much we could unpack about all this. We could, but I think, for the sake of time here and to, to try to wrap it up as we bring this to a close, the question we might want to ask ourselves is how receptive am I to growth? Okay. That's a good question. How receptive am I to growth? And here's what sometimes lack of receptivity looks like. Let's agree to disagree. Oh, I don't see what you're saying. So let me think on it. That's positive. That's, that's a neutral way to say, leave me alone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I've never heard that before. Or that's just not me. Well, maybe it's not you. <laughs> but remember, we're supposed to have be transforming ourselves to be in the likeness of Christ. So to say that's not me, what does that really say? Hmm. I'm going to go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> go on, go on. That's, that's saying I really don't want to, or I'm afraid to. So I'd rather just stay where I am. Hmm. I'd rather just stay where I am. Hmm. Is that then growth? I think that's not just rhetorical. I'll answer that one too. No. You don't stay the same if you're growing. But growth is uncomfortable for many of us. Change is uncomfortable. My dad used to say this all the time uh, when I sometimes didn't always want to. He said, when you step on a ladder, he said, Christianity is kind of like a ladder. And growth is like a ladder. Mm. Rung number one, you step on it, you see a little bit more. And then you have to adjust to what you see. And then you step to the next rung, you see a little bit more. And then you adjust to that growth. You step on the third rung, you even see more. At that point, you can either, you have two options too. You can become humbled because you realize there's so much you don't know that you didn't know that you didn't know, right, or whatever. Right. But you also see opportunities to grow, and then that's an opportunity to partner, mentor with someone to help, rather than say, "This is it." Now, I don't, I don't want to go to the next rung. I don't want to do any. It's, it's not allowing God to work in us, and help us be the best we can be. And all I can say is, we bring this to a close. I'm not the same guy today than I was 20 or 30 years ago. And thank goodness. Thank God. But it also allows me to be sensitive to those who maybe I was there at some point. 
Well, and I would also just remind people of this and myself and you, you, Jaron, that although that is true, God doesn't love you more now than he did back then. Absolutely. And, and that's important to say to people because I don't, I, I know when we disciple people, I want you to hear this, people who are listening. Jesus doesn't love some future version of yourself more than what he right. loved you exactly right now. Now, as you move up that ring, you're going to flourish more. Uh, as you, as you, we talked we talk last week, surrender to win. You're going to have more yeah. wins. You're going to be looking more like Jesus. You're going to be living right. into the purposes and mission of Jesus. But he's not going to love you more five rings up from where he loves you right now. And that's what's so and, amazing what's happening here in chapter 23. And, and excellent point. It's the same as a parent. The parent right. doesn't love you more. That's right. Because you are growing. They love you the same. There you go. They're just appreciative of, the, of your growth. Right. Right. You're, then, appreciative. You're then, appreciative of your growth. You're appreciative of your growth. And then you have the opportunity to then share that growth with others. Well, you are now better able to be used as a vessel come on. because now you have grown. Parents, God sees that. So now more opportunities, more willingness. And that's allowing even more compassion. Because sometimes we've heard it said, you give a person power and you find out what they're made of. Well, I, I believe this is why you, you don't have immature people. I'll just say it that way, not age-wise. You got to have some, 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 some stuff you've gone through a little bit right. so right. that you can appreciate some things. So let's bring this, because I know we got to bring this to a close. And we, we talked about Jesus on the cross and how, uh, he didn't do any retaliation and so forth, but a lot, there's a lot about the cross, but I want to just read this about how we can embrace the cross and close things with this. Uh, as we embrace the cross, it removes us out of the way of trying to save ourselves. Pretty powerful. Love it that. just takes us, we can get out of trying to try to save ourselves. It removes that. It's an opportunity for a new life transformation as we talked about an opportunity where god provides grace and you talked about grace just now god gives us he helps us through his grace nothing we earn yes but his grace now comes into effect and now here for us now because of god's offering because of the opportunities because of his grace i live in a way to honor Christ because of God's grace, because of the opportunities, because of the offering. I'm showing thankfulness and gratitude in the way that I live to honor that grace. I am transforming and I'm open to transformation of what I expect of myself and what I expect of others. Yep. What I expect of myself and what I expect of others. So a few teachings as we close this. Yeah. Are we aware that God commands us to forgive? Ephesians 4, verse 32. We're basically commanded to forgive. Um, and we can read that on our own. I've heard it said that since we live in a fallen world, that maybe somebody, Don might have said this, I, I, I got it from somebody, that we maybe should live, since we live in a fallen world, maybe we should just be in a perpetual state of forgiveness. Wow, that's good. A perpetual state of forgiveness. Yes. Because we live in a fallen world, Satan-driven world. People are going to do stuff. And can we wallow with them and wrestle with them? We just need to learn how to deal with it. I've said, I've heard it said, and I, I agree with this. If we can go through a whole day and we're just fine with the way things are, we might have to ask ourselves, are we on Jesus' side or on Satan's side? Because yep. see, Satan doesn't care whether we give him acknowledgement or not. <laughs> It takes a little effort to be on Jesus' side. 
So if I can go through my whole day and say, hey, man, things will find those, then we might need to do a, as one preacher, a friend of mine says, we might need to do a checkup from the neck up. Yeah. Because maybe we're not lining up as well as we need to. Are we, are, are we aware of kindness as an aroma of Christ? Do we reflect Christ in our daily living? A couple more points. Are we aware that maybe in our environment, wherever we might happen to be, that we might be the only Jesus that a person sees that day? Maybe, whatever. We might be the only Jesus. So are we aware that we're on stage? Are we aware that we should be doing the aroma and being the representative? And I'll leave us with this thought about an acronym that uh, is popular. The acronym is uh, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Well, that's a good question. But I'd like to suggest that we not have a question Maybe we should make a statement. Okay. What did Jesus do? Come on. What did he do? And if we're not sure what he did, because he he handled all, then maybe that's the time for us to do a little referencing. Yeah. Reading in the word, say, what did Jesus do? And then as the Bible, now we go and do likewise. Let's go. Thank you for... Come on. on the opportunity. I hope these words and things have been uh, helpful. Uh, I know it's been helpful for me as I've gone through it. So uh, thank you so much and appreciate the congregation, our, our, the folks and uh, our love first and the ability to reach out and affect not just our own small community, but the nation and the world. And let's continue to move forward and be in a realm of Christ, be his ambassador and love first. Hey, Jaron, I love you, brother. Thank you so much for doing this class. Um, class, remember, we're not having uh, the, we're not having Luke's Day next week or the following Sunday. We'll start back the first Sunday in December, uh, and then we'll have one more Sunday after that to finish up our class. But this has been such a great series, and this class has been amazing. So, so thank you so much, Jaron. Hey, everybody, have a great Thanksgiving week. Bye. Absolutely. Thank you.